How is it that I gave you a different mic and cord this week, and still you've got the one that's bad? Karma? Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Ba weep, grana weep, nini bong. Gesundheit? It's the universal greeting, come on. Very sad. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 4, page 21. All right. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. That's the robot, R-O-8-O-T. And... Announcer Man is here. The ever-popular Announcer Man. And today, wow, we've got a special treat for y'all. This is the longest story we've ever done on the Dune Steef. So long, in fact, that we've decided to split it in two. I almost said in half. Yeah, it's not quite in half. So today we present to you the first part of A Place So Foreign by Cory Doctorow. About the author. Cory Doctorow is a science fiction author, activist, journalist, and blogger, the co-editor of Boing Boing, and the author of the best-selling Tor Teens, HarperCollins UK novel Little Brother. He is former European director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation and co-founded the UK Open Rights Group. Born in Toronto, Canada, he now lives in London. We'd like to thank Julie Hoverson and Josh Roseman for lending their voices to today's episode. And you can check out links to Julie, Josh, and Cory Doctorow in the show notes. A Place So Foreign by Cory Doctorow My pa disappeared somewhere in the wilds of 1975 when I was just 14 years old. He was the ambassador to 1975, but back home in 1898 in New Jerusalem, Utah, they all thought he was ambassador to France. When he disappeared, Mom and I came back through the triple bolted door that led from our apt in 1975 to our horse barn in 1898. We returned to the dusty streets of New Jerusalem, and I had to keep on reminding myself that I was supposed to have been in France and parlez vu for my chums and tell whoppers about the Eiffel Tower and the fancy bread and the snails and frogs we'd eaten. I was born in New Jerusalem and raised there till I was ten. Then, one summer's day, my pa sat me on his knee and told me we'd be going away for a while, that he had a new job. But what about the store, I said, scandalized. My pa's wonderful store, the only general store in town not run by the saints, was my second home. I'd spent my whole life crawling and then walking on the dusty wooden floors, checking stock and unpacking crates with waybills from exotic places like Salt Lake City and even San Francisco. Pa looked uncomfortable. Mr. Johnstone is buying it. My mouth dropped. James H. Johnstone was as dandified a city slicker as you'd ever hope to meet. He'd blown into town on the weekly Zephyr Speedball, and skinny Tommy Benson had hauled his three huge steamer trunks to the Cowboy Hotel. He'd tipped Tommy two dollars in Wells Fargo notes, and later, in the empty lot behind the smithy, all the kids in New Jerusalem had gathered round Tommy to goggle at the small fortune in queer, never-seen bills. Pa, no, I said without thinking. I knew that if my chums ordered their fathers round like that, they'd get a whipping. But my pa almost never whipped me. He smiled and stretched his thick mustache across his face. James, I know you love the store, but it's already been decided. Once you've been to France, you'll see that it has wonders that beat anything that store can deliver. Nothing's better than a store, I said. He laughed and rumpled my hair. (laughs) Don't be so sure, son. There are more things in heaven and earth that are dreamed of in your philosophy. It was one of his sayings from Shakespeare, who he'd studied back east before I was born. It meant that the discussion was closed. I decided to withhold judgment until I saw France, but still couldn't shake the feeling that my pa was going soft in the head. Mr. Johnstone wasn't fit to run an apple cart. He was short and skinny and soft, not like my pa, who... 
as far as I was concerned, was the biggest, strongest man in the whole world. I loved my pa. Well, when we packed our bags and Pa went into the horse barn to hitch up our team, I figured we'd be taking a short trip out to the train station. All my chums were waiting there to see us off, and I'd promised my best pal Ollie Swain's daughter that I'd give him my coonskin cap to wear until we came back. But instead, Pa rode us to the edge of town, where the road went to rutted trail and salt flats, and there was Mr. James H. Johnstone in his own fancy pants trap. Pa and me moved our luggage into Johnstone's trap and got inside with Mama and hunkered down so he couldn't see us from outside. Mama said, You just hush up now, James. There's parts of this trip that we couldn't tell you about before we left. But you're going to have to stay quiet and hold on to your questions until we get to where we're going. I nearly said, To where we're going? But I didn't, because Mama had never looked so serious in all my born days. So I spent an hour hunkered down in there, listening to the clatter of the wheels and trying to guess where we were going. When I heard the trap stop and a set of wooden doors closed, all my guesses dried up and blew away, because I couldn't think of anywhere we would have heard those sounds out in the desert. So imagine my surprise when I stood up and found us right in our very own horse barn, having made a circle around town and back to where we'd started from. Mama held a finger up to her lips and then took Mr. John Stone's soft, girlish hand as he helped her down from the trap. My pa and Mr. John Stone started shifting one of the piles of hay bales that stacked to the rafters until they had revealed a triple-bolted door that looked new and sturdy, fresh sawn edges still bright and yellow, not the weathered brown of the rest of the barn. Pa took a key ring out of his vest pocket and unlocked the door, then swung it open. Each of us shouldered our bags and walked through in eerie silence into a pitch-black room. Pa reached out and pulled the door shut. Then there was a sharp click, and we were in 1975. Nineteen seventy-five was a queer sight. Our apartment was a lozenge of silver, spoked into the hub of a floating null G donut. Pa did something fancy with his hands, and the walls went transparent, and I swear, I I dropped to the floor and hugged the nubby rubber tiles for all I was worth. My eyes were telling me that we were hundreds of yards off the ground, and while I jumped from the rafters of the horse barn into the hay countless times, I suddenly discovered that I was afraid of heights. After that first dizzying glimpse of 1975, I kept my eyes squeezed shut and held on for all I was worth. After a minute or two of this, My stomach told me that I wasn't falling, and I couldn't hear any rushing wind, any bird calls, anything except Mama and Pa laughing fit to bust. I opened one eye and snuck a peek. My folks were laughing so hard, they had to hold on to each other to stay up, and they were leaning against thin air, Pa's back pressed up against nothing at all. Cautiously, I got to my feet and walked over to the edge. I extended one finger, and it bumped up against an invisible wall cooled and smooth as glass in winter. James, said my pa, smiling so wide that his thick mustache stretched all the way across his face. Welcome to 1975. Paul's ambassadorial mission meant that he often spent long weeks away from home, teleporting in only for Sunday dinner, the stink of aliens and distant worlds clinging to him even after he washed up. The last Sunday dinner I had with him, Mama had made mashed potatoes and cornbread and sausage gravy and turkey, spending the whole day with the wood-fired cooker back in 1898. Oh, actually, it was 1901 by then, but I always thought of it as 1898. She'd moved the cooker into the horse barn after a week of wrestling with the gadgets we had in our 1975 kitchen, and when Pa had warned her that the smoke was going to raise questions in New Jerusalem, she explained that she was going to run some flexible exhaust hose through the door into 75 and into our app's air scrubber. Pa had shook his head and smiled at her, and every Sunday, she dragged the exhaust pipe through the door. That night, Pa sat down and said grace, and he was in his shirt sleeves with his suspenders down, and it almost felt like home. Almost felt like a million Sunday dinners eaten by gaslight with a sweaty pitcher of lemonade in the middle of the table and seasonal wildflowers and a stinky cheroot for Pa afterwards as he tipped his chair back and rested one hand on his belly 
as if he couldn't believe how much Mama had managed to stuff in him this time. How are your studies coming, James? He asked me when the robotler had finished clearing the plates and clattered away into its nook. Very well, sir. We're starting calculus now. Truth be told, I hated calculus, hated Isaac Newton and asymptotes and the whole smelly business. Even with the viral learning shots, it was like swimming in molasses for me. Calculus? Well, well, well. This was one of Pa's catch-all phrases like, How about that? Or, what do you know? Well, 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 I can't believe how much they stuff into kids' heads here. Yes, sir. There's an awful lot left to learn yet. We did a subject every two weeks. So far, I'd done French, molecular and cellular biology, physics and astrophysics, Esperanto, Cantonese and Mandarin, and an alien language whose name translated as standard. I'd been exempted from history, of course, along with the other kids there from the past, the Chinese girl from the Ming Dynasty, the Roman boy, and the engine kid from South America. Paul laughed around his cigar and crossed his legs. His shoes were so big, they looked like canoes. There surely is, son. There surely is. And how are you doing with your classmates? Any tussles your teacher will want to talk to me about? No, sir. We're friendly as all get out, even the girls. The kids in 75 didn't even notice what they were doing in school. They just sat down at their workstations and waited to have their brains filled with whatever was going on and left at three, and never complained about something being too hard or too dull. That's good to hear, son. You've always been a good boy. Tell you what, you bring home a good report this Christmas, and I'll take you to see Saturn's rings on vacation. Mama shot him a look then, but he pretended he didn't see it. He stubbed out his cigar, hitched up his suspenders, and put on his tailcoat and top hat and ambassadorial sash, and picked up his leather case. Good night, son. Good night, Eula. I'll see you on Wednesday, he said, and stepped into the teleporter. That was the last time I ever saw him. He died from bad snails? Ollie Swain's daughter said to me yet again. I balled up a fist and stuck it under his nose. For the last time, yes. Ask me again and I'll feed you this. I'd been back for a month, and in all that time, Ollie had skittered around me like a shy pony, always nearby, but afraid to talk to me. Finally, I'd grabbed him and shook him and told him not to be such a ninny. Tell me what was on his mind. Well, he wanted to know how my pa had died over in France. I told him the reason that Mama and Mr. Johnstone and the man from the embassy had worked out together. Now, I regretted it. I couldn't get him to shut up. Sorry, all right, sorry, he said, taking a step backwards. We were in the orchard behind the schoolyard, chucking rotten apples at the tree trunks to watch them splatter. Wanna hear some? Sure, I said. Tommy Benson sweet on Marta Helprin. It's disgusting. They hold hands in church. None of the fellas will talk to him. I didn't see what the big deal was. Back in 75, we had a two-week session on sexual reproduction, like all the other subjects. Most of the kids there were already in couples, sneaking off to low-G bounceateria and renting private cubes with untraceable cash tokens. I'd even tussled with one girl, Katibi Mbuto, another exchange student, from United Africa Trading Sphere. I'd picked her up at her apt, and her father had even shaken my hand. They grew up fast in UATS. Of course, I'd never let on to my folks. Pa would have broken an axle. That's pretty disgusting, all right, I said unconvincingly. You want to go down to the river? I told Amos and Luke that I'd meet them after lunch. I didn't much feel like it, but I didn't know what else to do. We walked down to the swimming hole where some boys were already naked, swimming and horsing around. I found myself looking away, conscious of their nudity in a way that I'd never been before. All the boys in town swam there all summer long. I turned my back to the group and stripped down, then ran into the water as quick as I could. I paddled around a little, half-heartedly, and then I found myself being pulled under. My sinuses filled with water and I yelled a stream of bubbles and closed my mouth on a swallow of water. Strong hands pulled at my ankles. I kicked out as hard as I could and connected with someone's head. The hands loosened and I shot up like a cork, sputtering and coughing. I ran for the shore and saw one of the Allen brothers surfacing, rubbing at his head and laughing. 
Four Allen boys lived on a ranch with their parents out by the salt flats, and we only saw them when they came into town with their folks for supplies. I'd never liked them, but now I saw red. <laughs> you pig! I shouted at him. You stupid rotten pig! What the heck do you think you were doing? The Allens kept on laughing. I used to know some of their names, but in the time I'd been in 75, they'd grown as indistinguishable as twins. Big hard boys with their heads shaved for lice. They pointed at me and laughed. I scooped up a flat stone from the shore and threw it at the head of the one who'd pulled me under as hard as I could. Lucky for him, and me, I was too angry to aim properly and the stone hit him in the shoulder, knocking him backwards. He shouted at me. It was like the roar of a wild animal. And the four brothers charged. Ollie appeared at my side. Run! He shouted. I was too angry. I bawled my fists and stood my ground. The first one shot out of the water towards me and punched me so hard in the guts I saw stars. I fell to the ground, gasping. I looked up at a forest of strong, bare legs and knew they'd surrounded me. <gasps> it's the sheriff! Ollie shouted. The legs disappeared. Oh, I struggled to my knees. Ollie collapsed to the ground beside me, laughing. <laughs> Did you see the way they ran? The sheriff never comes down to the river. Thanks, I said around gasps and started to get dressed. Any time, he said. Now let's do some swimming. No, I, I gotta go home and help Mama, I lied. I didn't feel like going skinny dipping anymore. Maybe never again. Ollie gave me a queer look. Okay, see you. I went straight home, pelting down the road as fast as I could, not even looking where I was going. I let the door slam behind me and took the stairs two at a time up to the attic ladder, then bolted the trap door shut behind me and sat in the dark with my knees in my chest. Down below, Mama let out a half-hearted, James, is that you? Like she always did since I came back home. I ignored her, like always, and she stopped worrying about it, like always. Pa's last trip had been to the Dalai Lama's court in 1975. The man from the embassy said that he was going to talk with the monks about a white paper that the two embassies were jointly presenting on the effect of mimetic ambassadorships on the reincarnated soul. It was all nonsense to me. He'd never arrived. The teleporter said that it had put him down as gentle as you like on the floor of the Lama's floating castle over the Caspian Sea, but the monks never saw him. And that was that. It had been a month since our return. I'd ventured out into town and looked up my chums and found them so full of gossip that didn't mean anything to me, so absorbed with games that seemed childish to me, so strange that I'd retreated home. I'd prowled around our house like a burglar at first, and when I came back to the attic, all the numbness that had enveloped me since the man from the State Department had teleported into our apt melted away, and I started bawling. The attic had always been Pa's domain. He'd come up here with whatever crackpot invention he'd ordered this month, out of a catalog or one of the expensive foreign journals he subscribed to, and tinker and swear and hit his thumbnail and tear his pants on a stray dingus and smoke his cheroots and have a heck of a time. The muffled tread of his feet and the distant cursing while I sat in the parlor downstairs had been the homiest sound I knew. Mama and I would lock eyes every time a particularly forceful round of hollers shook down, and Mama would get a little smile, and her eyes would crinkle, and I felt like we were sharing a secret. Now, the attic was my private domain. There was the elixir shelf, full of patent medicines, hair tonics, and soothing syrups. There was the bookcase full of wild theories and fantastic adventure stories. There were the crates full of dangerous coal-fired machines, an automatic clothes washing machine, a cherry pitter, and other devices whose nature I couldn't even guess at. None of them had ever worked. But I liked to run my hands over them, feel the smooth steel of their parts, disassemble and reassemble them. Back in 75, I'd once tried to take the robotler apart just to get a look at how it was all put together. But it was a lost cause. I couldn't even figure out how to get the cover off. I walked through the cool dark, the only light coming from the grimy attic window, and fondled each piece. 
I picked up an oil can and started oiling the joints and bearings and axles of each machine in turn. Pa would have wanted to know that everything was in good working order. I think you should be going to school, James, Mama said at breakfast. I'd already done my morning chores, bringing in the coal, chopping kindling, taking care of the milch cows, and making my bed. I took another forkful of sausage and a spoonful of mush, chewed, and looked at my plate. It's time. It's time. You can't spend the rest of your life sulking around here. Your father would have wanted us to get on with our lives. Even though I wasn't looking at her when she said this, I knew that her eyes were bright with tears, the way they always got when she mentioned Pa. His chair sat, empty, at the head of the table. I had another bite of sausage. James Arthur Nicholson, look at me when I speak to you. I looked up, reflexively, as I always did when she used my full name. My eyes slid over her face, then focused on a point over her left shoulder. Yes, am You're going to school today. And I expect to get a good report from Mr. Adelson. Yes, am We have two schools in New Jerusalem. The elementary school that was built 20 years before, when they put in the wooden sidewalks in the town hall, and the non-denominational academy that was built just before I left for 1975. Miss Tannenbaum, a spinster lady with a mustache and a bristling German accent, terrorized the little kids in the elementary school. I'd been stuck in her class for five long years. Mr. Adelson, who was raised in San Francisco and who had worked as a roustabout, a telegraph operator, and a merchant seaman, taught the academy. And his wild stories were all all they could talk about. He raised one eyebrow quizzically when I came through the door at eight o'clock that morning. He was tall, like my pa. But Pa had been as big as an ox, and Mr. Adelson was thin and wiry. He wore rumpled pants and a shirt with a wilted celluloid collar. He had a skinny little beard that made him look like a gentleman pirate, and used some shiny pomade to grease his hair straight back from his high forehead. I caught him reading, thumbing the handwritten pages of a leather-bound volume. Mr. Adelson? Why, James Nicholson, what can I do for you, Sonny? New Jerusalem only had but 2,000 citizens and only a hundred or so in town proper, so of course he knew who I was. But it surprised me to hear him pronounce my name in his creaky, weather-beaten voice. My mother says I have to go to the academy. She does, hey. How do you feel about that? I snuck a look at his face to see if he was putting me on, but I couldn't tell. He'd raised up his other eyebrow now and was looking hard at me. There might have been the beginning of a smile on his face, but it was hard to tell with the beard. I guess it don't matter how I feel. Oh, I don't know about that. This is a school, not a prison, after all. How old are you? Fourteen, sir. That would put you in with the seniors. Do you think you can handle their course of study? It's halfway through the semester now, and I don't know how much they taught you when you were over in... He swallowed. France. I didn't know what to say to that, so I just stared at my hard, uncomfortable shoes. How are your maths? Have you studied geometry, basic algebra? Yes, sir. They taught us all that, and lots more besides. I had the feeling of icebergs of knowledge floating in my brain, ready to crest the waves and crash against the walls of my skull. Very good. We will be studying maths today in the seniors' class. We'll see how you do. Is that all right? Again, I didn't know if he was really asking, so I just said, Yes, sir. Marvelous. We'll see you at the 8.30 bell, then. And James... He paused, waited until I met his gaze. His eyebrows were at rest. I'm sorry about your father. I met him several times. He was a good man. Thank you, sir, I said, unable to look away from his stare. The first half of the day passed with incredible sloth as I copied down problems to my slate and pretended to puzzle over them before writing down the answer I'd known the minute I saw the question. 
At lunch, I found a seat at the base of the big willow out front of the school and unwrapped the waxed paper from the thick ham sandwich Mama had fixed me. I munched it and conjugated Latin verbs in my head, trying to make the day pass. Ollie and the fellas were roughhousing in the yard, playing follow the leader with Amos Gunderson out front, showing off by walking on his hands and then springing upright. Amos's mother came from circus people in Russia, and all the kids in his family wanted to be acrobats when they grew up. I tried not to watch them. I was engrossed in a caterpillar that was crawling up my pants leg when Mr. Adelson cleared his throat behind me. I started, and the caterpillar tumbled to the ground, and then Mr. Adelson was squatting on his long haunches at my side. How are you liking your first day, James? He asked in his raspy voice. It's fine, sir. And the work? You're able to keep up with the class? It's not a problem for me. We studied this when I was away. Are you bored? Do you need more of a challenge? It's fine, sir. Unless you want to assign me some large prime factoring problems. Right, then. Don't hesitate to call on me if things are moving too slowly or too quickly. I mean that. I snuck another look at him. He seemed sincere. Why aren't you playing with your chums? I don't feel like it. You just wanted to think? I guess so. Why wouldn't he just leave me alone? It's hard to come home, isn't it? I stared at my shoes. What did he know about it? I've been around the world, you know that? I sailed with a tramp steamer, the Slippery Trick. I saw the naked savages of Polynesia and the voodoo witches that the freed slaves of the Caribbean worship and the coolies pulling rickshaws in Peking. It was so hard to come home to Frisco after five years at sea. To my surprise, he sat down next to me, in the dirt and roots at the base of the tree. You know, aboard the trick, they called me Runny Guts. I threw up every hour for my first month. I was more reliable than the watch, but they didn't mean anything by it. When you live with a crew for years, you become a different person. We'd be out at sea, nothing but water as far as the eye could see, and we'd be playing cards on deck. We told each other every joke we knew already, and every story about home, and we knew that deck of cards so well. Which one had salt water stains on the back, which one turned up at the corner, and which one had been torn. And we'd just scream at the sun, so bored! But... Then we'd put into port at some foreign city, and we'd all come down the plank in our best clothes. Twenty men who knew each other better than brothers, hard and brown for months at sea, and it felt like whatever happened in that strange port of call, we'd come out on top. And then I came back to Frisco, and the captain shook my hand and gave me a sack of gold and saw me off. And I'd never felt so alone. And I'd never seen a place so foreign. I went back to my old haunts, the saloons where I'd gone for a beer after a day's work at the docks, and the dance halls and the theaters, and I saw my old chums. That was hard, James. He stopped then. I found myself saying, How is it hard, Mr. Adelson? He looked surprised, like he'd forgotten that he was talking to me. Well, James... It's like this. When you're away that long, you get to invent yourself all over again. Of course, everyone invents themselves as they grow up. Your chums there? He gestured at the boys, who were now trying, with varying success, to turn somersaults, dirty in their school clothes. They're inventing themselves right now, whether they know it or not. The smart one, the strong one, the brave one, the sad one. What's going on while we watch? But when you go away, nobody knows you, and you can be whoever you want. You can shed your old skin and grow a new one. When we put out to sea, I was just a youngster, 18 years old and fresh from my pa's house. He was a cable car engineer and wanted me to follow in his shoes, get an apprenticeship and join him there under the hills, oiling the giant pulleys. But no, not me. I wanted to put out to sea and see the world. I'd never been out of the city. Can you believe that? 
The first port where I took shore leave was in Haiti. And when I stepped onto the dock, it was like my life was starting all over again. I got a tattoo. I drank hard liquor and gambled in the saloons and did all the things that a man did, as far as I was concerned. He had a faraway look now, staring at the boy's game without seeing it. And when I got back on board, sick and tired and broke, there was a new kid there, a negro from Port-au-Prince, who signed on to be a cabin boy. His name was Jean-Paul, and he didn't speak a word of English, and I didn't speak a word of French. But I took him under my wing, James, and acted like I'd been at sea all my life, and showed him the ropes, and taught him to play cards, and bossed him around, and taught him English, one word at a time. And that became the new me. Every time a new hand signed on, I would be his teacher, his mentor, his guide. And then I came home. As far as the folks back home were concerned, I was the kid they'd said goodbye to five years before. My father thought I was still a kid, even though I'd fought pirates and weathered storms. My chums wanted me to be the kid I'd been and do all the boring kid things we'd done before I left. Riding the trolleys, watching the vaudeville shows, fishing off the docks. Even though that stuff was still fun, it wasn't me. Not anymore. I missed the old me and felt him slipping away. So you know what I did? You moved to New Jerusalem? I moved to New Jerusalem. Well, to Salt Lake City first. I studied with the Jesuits to be a teacher. Then I saw an ad for a teacher in the paper, and I packed my bag and caught the next train, and here I am. Not the me that came home from sea, and not the me who I was before I went to sea, but someone in between. A new me. Teaching, but on dry land. And not chasing dangerous adventures, but still reading my old log book and smiling. We sat for a moment, in companionable silence. Then, abruptly, he checked his pocket watch and yelped. <gasps> Damn! Lunch was over twenty minutes ago. He leapt to his feet as smoothly as a boy and ran into the schoolhouse to ring the bell. I folded up the wax paper and thought about this adult who talked to me like an adult, who didn't worry about swearing or telling me about his adventures, and I made my way back to class. It went better the rest of that day. In 75, Pa had almost never been home, but his presence was always around us. I'd call the row butler out of its closet and have it affix its electrode fingertips to my temples and juice my endorphins after a hard day at school. And when I was done, the faint smell of Pa's hair oil, picked up from the trodes and impossible to be rid of, would cling to me. Or I'd sit down on the oubliette and find one of Pa's journals from back home, well-thumbed and open to an article on mental telepathy. We did ESP in school, and it was all about a race of alien traders who communicated in geometric thought pictures that took forever to translate. We'd never learned about magnetism and astral projection and all the other things Pa's journals were full of. And while I never doubted the things in Pa's journals, I never brought them up in class, neither. There were lots of different kinds of truth. James! Yes, Mama? I said on my way out to chop kindling. Did you finish your homework? Yes, Mama. Good boy. Homework had been some math, and some biology, and some geology. I'd done it before I'd left school. The report cards came out in the middle of December. Mr. Adelson sealed them with wax and thick brown envelopes, and handed them out at the end of the day. Sealing them was a dirty trick. It meant a boy would have to go home not knowing whether to expect a whipping or an extra slice of pie. And the fellows were as nervous as long-tailed cats in a rocking chair factory when class let out. For once, there was no horseplay afterwards. I came home and tossed the envelope on the kitchen table without a moment's worry. I'd aced every test. I'd done every take-home assignment. I'd led the class, in a bored, sleepy way, regurgitating the things they'd stuck in my brain in 1975. 
I went up to the attic and started reading one of Pa's adventure stories, Tarzan of the Apes, by the Frenchman Jules Verne. Pa had all of Verne's books, each of them crisply autographed on the inside cover. He'd met Verne on one of his diplomatic missions, and the two had been like two peas in a pod to hear him tell of it. They both subscribed to all the same crazy journals. I was reading my favorite part, where Tarzan meets the man in the balloon, when Mama's voice called from downstairs. James Arthur Nicholson, get your behind down here now. I jumped like I was stung, and rattled down the attic stairs so fast I nearly broke my neck, and then down into the parlor, where Mama was holding up my report card and looking fit to bust. Yes, Mama, I said. What is it? She handed me the report card and folded her arms over her chest. Explain that, mister. Make it good. I read the card, and my eyes nearly jumped out of my head. The rotten so-and-so had given me F's all the way down, in every subject. Below, in his seaman's hand, he'd written, James's performance this semester has disappointed me gravely. I would like it very much if I could meet with you and he, Mrs. Nicholson, at your earliest convenience to discuss his future at the Academy. Signed, Robert Adelson. Mama grabbed my ear and twisted. I howled and dropped the card. Before I knew what was happening, she had me over her knee and was paddling my bottom with her open hand. Hard. I don't. Whack. No what? Whack. You think. Whack. You're doing, James. Whack. If your father. Whack, whack. Were here. Whack. He'd switch you. Whack. Within an inch of your life. And she gave me a load more wax. I was too stunned even to cry or howl. Pa had only beat me twice in all the time I'd known him. Mama had never beat me. My bottom ached distantly, and I felt tears come to my eyes. Well, what do you have to say for yourself? Mama, it's a mistake, I began. You're darn right. No, really, I, I did all my homework. I passed all the exams. I showed them to you. You saw them. The unfairness of it made my heart hammer in time to the throbbing of my backside. Mama's breath fumed angrily out of her nose. You go straight to your room and stay there. We're going to see Mr. Adelson first thing tomorrow morning. What about my chores? I said. Oh, don't worry about that. You'll have plenty of chores to do when I let you out. I went to my room and stripped down and lay on my tummy and cracked my window so the icy winter air blew over my backside. I cried a veil of tears and rained down miserable, mean curses on everyone. Mama, Pa, and especially the lion, snaky, backstabbing, runny guts Adelson. Mama didn't get any less mad through the night. But when she came to my door at Cockcrow, she seemed to be holding it in better. My throat and eyes were sore as sandpaper from crying and Mama gave me exactly five minutes to wash up and dress before dragging me out to the horse barn. She'd already hitched up our team and refused my hand when I tried to help her up. I'd been angry and righteous when I woke, but seeing Mama's towering, barely controlled fury changed my mood to dire terror. I stared out at the trees and farms as we rode into town, feeling like a condemned man being taken to the gallows. Mama pulled up out front of the academy and marched me around back to the teacher's cottage. She rapped on the door and waited, blowing clouds of steam out of her nose into the frosty morning air. Mr. Adelson answered the door in shirt sleeves and suspenders, unshaved and bleary. His hair, normally neatly oiled and slicked, stuck out like frayed broom straw. The muscles on his thin arms stood out like snakes. He blinked at us, standing on his doorstep. Mrs. Nicholson, he said. Mr. Adelson, my mother said. We've come to discuss James's report card. Mr. Adelson smoothed his hair back and stepped aside. Please come in. Can I offer you some coffee? No, thank you. Mama said primly, standing in his foyer. He held out his hand for a coat and kerchief, and she handed them to him. I took off my coat and struggled out of my boots. He took them both and put them away in the closet. I'm going to have some coffee. Are you sure I can't offer you a cup? No, thank you all the same. As you wish. He disappeared down the dark hallway, and Mom and I found our way into his tiny parlor. Books were stacked every which way, dusty and precarious. Mom and I sat down on a pair of cushioned chairs, and Mr. Allison came in, holding two mugs of coffee. 
He set one down next to Mama on the floor, then smacked himself in the forehead. <sighs> you said no, didn't you? Sorry, I'm not quite awake yet. We'll leave it there. There's cream in it. Maybe the cat'll have some. He settled himself into another chair and sipped at his coffee. Let's start over, shall we? Hello, Mrs. Nicholson. Hello, James. I understand you're here to discuss James's report card. Mama sat back a little in her chair and let hint of a sardonic smile show on her face. Yes, we are. Forgive my coming by unannounced. Oh, it's nothing. Mr. Adelson drank more coffee. Mama smoothed her skirts. I kicked my feet against the rungs of my chair. Finally, it was too much for me. What's the big idea, anyway? I said, glaring daggers at him. I don't deserve no F. Any F, Mr. Adelson corrected. Why don't you think so? Well, because I did all my homework. I gave the right answers in class. I passed all the tests. It ain't fair. Not fair, my mama corrected, gently. She was staring distractedly at Mr. Adelson. What you say is true enough, James. What grade do you suppose you should have gotten? Why, an A. A an A+. plus, Perfect, I said, glaring at him again, daring him to say otherwise. Is that what an A-plus is for, James? Perfection? Sure, I said, opening my mouth without thinking. Mama shifted her stare to me. She was looking even more thoughtful. Why do you suppose you go to school? Because Mama says I have to, I said sullenly. James! Mama said. Oh, I suppose it's to learn things, I said. Mr. Allison smiled and nodded, the way he did when one of the students got the right answer in class. Well? Well, what? I said. What did you learn this semester? What? Everything you taught. Geometry, algebra, Latin, geography, biology, physics, grammar. I see, he said. James, what's the formula for determining the constant and the second derivative of an equation? I knew that one. It was one of Newton's dirty calculus proofs. Uh, it's a trick question. There's no way to get the constant of second derivative. Exactly right, he said. Yes, I said, and folded my arms across my chest. Where did you learn that? In, I started to say 1975, but caught myself. In France. Yes? Yes, I said. The fingers of dawn crept across my comprehension. Oh, Mama smiled at me. But he's not fair. So what if I already knew everything before I started? I still did all the work. Why are you in school, James? Mr. Nicholson asked me again. To learn. Well, I think you'd better start learning something, don't you? You're the brightest student in class. You're certainly smarter than I am. I'm just an old sailor struggling along with the rest of the class. But you, you've got it. You've been marking time in class all semester, and I dare say you haven't learned a single thing since you started. That's why you got F's. Mr. Adelson? Mama said. Am I to understand that James performed all his assignments satisfactorily? It was Mr. Adelson's turn to squirm. Y yes, but madam, you have to understand... Mama waved aside his objections. If James satisfactorily completed all the work assigned to him, then I think he should have a grade that reflects that. Don't you? She took a sip of her coffee. Yes, well... However, you do have a point. I didn't send my son to your school so that he could mark time, as you put it. I sent him there to learn, to be taught. Have you taught him anything, Mr. Adelson? Mr. Adelson looked so all-fired sad. I forgave him the report card and spoke up. Yes, Mama. Mama swiveled her head to me. Really? Yes. He taught me what I was at school for, just now. I see. Mama said. This is very good coffee, Mr. Adelson. Thank you, he said, and sipped at his. James, Mr. Adelson said, you've learned your first lesson. What do you propose your second should be? I don't know, I said, and went back to kicking the rungs of the chair. What is it that you've been doing since you came back to town, son? He asked. Hanging around in the attic, mostly. Reading, tinkering, like my pa. My husband's machines and journals are up there, Mama explained. Uh, and his books, I said. Books? Mr. Adelson looked suddenly interested. What kind of books? Adventure stories, Stevenson, Wells, 
Some of it's in French. We have all of Vern. Well, perhaps that can be your next assignment. I would like to see an original composition of no less than 20 pages discussing each work of Verne's, charting his literary progress. Due January 5th, please. 20 pages, I said. But it's the holidays. Very well. Whatever length the piece turns out is fine. But be sure you do justice to each work. By the time I got through with the assignment, it was 38 pages long. I never thought I could write that much, but it kept on coming. New thoughts about each book, each scene, the different worlds Vern had built, the fantastic slopes of Barsoom, the sinister island of Dr. Moreau, each one spawned a new insight. I felt like Vern's detective, Sherlock Holmes, assembling all of the seemingly insignificant details into some kind of coherent picture, finding the improbable links between the wildly different stories the Frenchman told. Mama was thrilled to see me working, papers spread out all around me on the kitchen table. I could have used Pa's study, but it felt like an invasion somehow, writing until my wrists cramped. She let me get away without doing my chores, rising early to milk the cow, bringing in the eggs from the hen house, even chopping the kindling. Just so long as I was writing, she was happy to let me go on shirking my responsibilities. Even on Christmas Eve, I was too distracted to really enjoy the smells of goose and ham and the stuffing Mama spent days preparing. I was still writing when she told me to go change and set the table for three. We're having Mr. Johnstone to dinner, she said. I made a face. Mr. Johnstone was the only one in town that I could have talked to about my time in 1975, but I never did. He had a way of bossing a fellow around while seeming to be nice to him. He still ran Pa's store, using ladders to reach the high shelves that Pa just plucked things off of. I had to see him when Mama sent me on errands there, but I made sure that I left as quickly as I could. Mama kept saying that I should ask him for a job but I was pretty good at changing the subject whenever it came up. I put away my papers and changed into my Sunday clothes. I'd been hinting to Mama lately that a boy just wasn't complete without a puppy, so I put an extra shine on my shoes and said a quick prayer that I wouldn't find socks and picture books under the tree. Mr. Johnstone arrived with a double armload of gifts. Well, he did run my pa's store, after all, so he could get things wholesale. I took his parcels from him and set them under the tree. Then that dandified sissy actually kissed my mama on the cheek, lifting a sprig of mistletoe up with one hand. When Pa and Mama stood together, she'd barely come up to his shoulder, while Mr. Johnstone had to stand on tiptoe to get the mistletoe over their heads. Merry Christmas, Eula, he said. She took his hands and said, Merry Christmas, James. I wanted to be sick. Mr. Johnstone had a whiskey in our parlor before we ate, sitting in my pa's chair, smoking a cigar from my pa's humidor. Mama ordered me to keep him company while she set out the meal. Did they call you Jimmy? He asked me, staring down his long, pointy nose. No, sir. James. It's a fine name, isn't it? Served me well, man and boy. He made a face that was supposed to be funny, like he'd bitten to a lemon. I like it fine, sir. Are you having any problems adjusting now that you're home? Finding it hard to relate to the other fellows? No, sir. You don't find it strange? After seeing 1975? No, sir. It's home. Ha! He said, as though I'd said something profound. I guess it is at that. Say, why don't you come by the store sometime? I just got samples from a new candy company in Oregon, and I need to get an unbiased opinion before I order. He gave me a pinched smile, like he thought he was Santa Claus. Mama doesn't like me eating sweets, I said, and stared at my reflection in my shoes. Mama rescued me by coming into the parlor then, looking young and pretty in her best dress. Dinner is served, gentlemen. We followed her into the dining room, and Mr. Johnstone took my pa's seat at the head of the table and carved the goose. Even though the bird was brown and juicy, I found I didn't have any appetite. I have word from Pondicherry, Mr. Johnstone said as he poured gravy over his second helping of mashed potatoes. Yes? Mama said. 
Who's he? I asked. Your father's successor, Mr. Johnstone said. A British officer from New Delhi. A fat little man and awfully full of himself. I repressed a snort. For my money, Mr. Johnstone was as full of himself as one man could be. I couldn't imagine a blacker kettle. He says that Nussbaum from 1952 New York has rolled back relations with extraterrestrials by 50 years. He sold a centurion a half a million defective umbrellas from his brother-in-law's factory. The New Yorkers are all defending him, caveat emptor. I never could keep track of who was friendly and who wasn't, Mama said. It was all Greek to me. Politics. Mr. Johnstone opened his mouth to explain, but Mama held up one hand. No, no, I don't want to understand. Les used to lecture me about this from dawn till dusk. She smiled a little sad smile and stared off at the cabbage roses on our dining room walls. Mr. Johnstone put one hand over hers. He was a good man, Eula. Mama stood and smoothed their skirts. I'll get dessert. I didn't get a puppy. Mr. Johnstone gave me an air rifle that I was sure Mama would have fits over. But she just smiled. She gave me a beautiful fountain pen and a green blotter and a ream of creamy thick paper. The pen made the most beautiful jet black marks, and the paper drank it up like a thirsty man in the desert. I recopied my essay the next day, sitting with Mama in the parlor while she darned socks. Mr. Johnstone had given her a tin of cosmetics from Paris that he'd ordered in special. I'd heard Mama say that only dance hall girls wore makeup, but she blushed when he gave it to her. I gave her a carving I'd done of the row butler we'd had in 75. I'd whittled it out of a block of pine and sanded it and oiled it until it was as smooth as silk. Ollie Swain's daughter came by after supper and asked if I wanted to go out and play with the fellas. To my surprise, I found I did. We had a grand afternoon pelting each other with snowballs, a game that turned into a full-scale war as all the older boys back from high school came out and joined in. And then, later, all the men, even the sheriff and Mr. Adelson. I never laughed so much in all my life, even when I got one right in the ear. Mr. Adelson led a charge of adults against the fort that most of the academy boys were hiding behind. But I saw him planning it and started laying in ammunition long before they made their go, and we sent them back with their tails between their legs. I hit him smack in the behind with one ball as he dove for cover. All his mother gave us both good Svenska hot cocoa afterwards with fresh whipped cream, and Ollie and I exchanged gifts. He gave me a tin soldier, a confederate who was caught in the act of falling over backwards, clutching his chest. I gave him my best marble. We followed his mother around their house, recounting the adventures in the snow, until she told me it was time for me to go home. School started again, and I went in early the first day to turn in my paper. Mr. Adelson took it without comment and scanned the first few paragraphs. Thank you, James. I think this will do nicely. I'll have it graded for you in the afternoon. I met Ollie out in the orchard, where he was chopping kindling for the school stove, a job we all took turns at. I hear you might be getting a new pile for Christmas, he said. He gave me a smile that meant something, but I couldn't guess what. What is that supposed to mean? I asked. My mama says your mama had old man Johnstone over for Christmas dinner. And the widow Ott told my mama that she'd connected one or two calls between your house and the store every day in the last month. My mama says that Johnstone is courting your mama. Mrs. Ott isn't supposed to talk about the calls she connects, I said as my mind reeled. It's like a telegraph operator. It's a confidential trust. Mr. Adelson had told me that once when he was telling me stories about his life before he went to sea. So, is it true? No! I said, surprising myself with my vehemence. My mama just didn't want him to be alone at Christmas. Ollie swung the axe a few more times. Well, sure. But what about all the telephone calls? That's business. The store is still partly ours. Mama's just looking after our interests. If you say so, he said. I shoved him hard. I drew a line in the snow with my toe. 
I do say so. Step across the line if you say otherwise. Ollie got to his feet and looked at me. I don't want to fight with you, James. I was just telling you what my mama said. Well, your mama ought to mind her own business, I said, baiting him. That did it. He stepped over and popped me one right in the nose. Ollie and I had been chums since we could walk, and we'd had a few fights in our days. This time, it was different. I was so angry at him, at my mama, at my pa, at New Jerusalem. And we just kept on swinging at each other until Mr. Adelson came out to ring the bell and separated us. My nose was sore and I was limping, and I'd torn all his jacket and bent his fingers back, so he cradled his hand in the crook of his arm. Boys, Mr. Adelson said, what the hell do you think you're doing? You're supposed to be friends. His language shocked me, but I was still plenty angry. He's no friend of mine, I said. That's fine with me, Ollie said and glared at me. The other kids were milling around, and Mr. Adelson gave us both a look that could melt steel, then rang the bell. I could hardly concentrate in class that day. My mama getting married? A new pa? It couldn't be true. But in my mind, I kept seeing my mama and that John Stone kissing under the mistletoe, and him sitting in my pa's chair drinking his whiskey. Ollie's desk was next to mine, and he kept shooting me dirty looks. Finally, I leaned over and whispered, Cut it out, you idiot, Ollie said. You're the idiot. I think you got your brain scrambled in France, James. I'll scramble your brains. Gentlemen, said Mr. Adelson, do you have something you'd like to share with the class? No, no sir, sir, we said together and exchanged glares. James, perhaps you'd like to come up to the front and finish the lesson? Sir, I said, looking at the blackboard. He'd been going through quadratics, an elaborate first principles proof. I believe you know this already, don't you? Come up to the front and finish the lesson. Slowly, I got up from my desk, leaving my slate, and made my way up to the front. Some of the kids giggled. I picked up a piece of chalk from the chalk well and started to write on the board. Mr. Adelson walked back to my seat and sat down. I stopped and looked over my shoulder, and he gave me a little scooting gesture that meant go on. I did, and by the end of the hour, I found that I was enjoying myself. I stopped frequently for questions and erased the board over and over again, filling it with steady columns of numbers and equations. I stopped noticing Mr. Adelson in my seat, and when he stood and thanked me and told us we could eat our lunches, it seemed like no time at all had passed. Mr. Adelson looked up from my essay. James, I'd like to have a chat with you. Stay behind, please. Sit, he said, offering me the chair at his desk. He sat on one of the front row desks and stared at me for a long moment. What was that mess this morning all about, James? He asked. Ollie and I had an argument, I said sullenly. I can see that. What was it about, if you don't mind my asking? He said something about my mama. I see. Well, having met your mother, I feel confident in saying that she's more than capable of defending herself. Am I right? Yes, sir, I said. Then we won't see a repeat? No, sir, I said. I didn't plan on talking to Ollie ever again. Then we'll say no more about it. Now, about this morning's lesson. You did very well. It was a dirty trick, I said. He grinned like a pirate. I suppose it was. I wouldn't have played it on you if I didn't have every confidence in your abilities, though. He leaned across and picked up my essay from his desk. It was this that convinced me, really. This is as good as anything I've seen in scholarly journals. I've half a mind to send it to the idler. I'm just a kid. You're an extraordinary boy. I'm tempted to let you teach all the classes and take up whittling. He said it so deadpan, I couldn't tell if he was kidding me. Oh, you can't do that. I'm not nearly ready to take over. He laughed. <laughs> You're readier than you think. But I expect the town council would stop my salary unless I did some of the work around here. Still, I think that's the most active I've seen you since you came to my class. And I'm running out of ideas to keep you busy. Maybe I'll keep you teaching maths. 
I'll give you my lesson plan to take home before school's out. Yes, sir. Miss Rattleson gave me a stack of papers tied up with twine after he dismissed the class for the day. I went home and did my chores, then unwrapped the parcel in the parlor. The lesson plans were there laid out day by day, and in the center of them was a smaller parcel wrapped in colored paper. Merry Christmas was written across it in his hand. I opened it and found a slim book, War of the Worlds by Verne. For some reason, it rang a bell. I thought that maybe it had been on our bookcase in 75, but somehow it hadn't made it back home with us. I opened it and read the inscription he'd written. From one traveler to another, Merry Christmas. I forced myself to read the lesson plans for the next month before I allowed myself to start the Verne. And once I started, I found I couldn't stop. Mama had to drag me away for dinner. My trip back to 1975 wasn't planned, but it wasn't an accident either. We'd gotten a new load of hay in for our team, and Mama added stacking it in the horse barn to my chores. I'd been consciously avoiding the horse barn since Pa disappeared. Every time I looked at it, I felt a little hexed, a little frightened. But Mama had a philosophy. A boy should face up to his fears. She'd been terrified of spiders when she was a girl, and she told me that she had made a point of picking up every spider she saw and letting it crawl around on her face. After a year of that, she said, she never met a spider that frightened her. Mama had been sending me to the store more and more, too, and having Mr. Johnstone over for dinner every Friday night. She knew I didn't like him one little bit, and she said that I would just have to learn to live with what I didn't like, and if that was the only thing I learned from her, it would be enough. I preferred the horse barn. I worked close to the door the first day, which is no way to do it, of course. If you blocked the door, it just made it harder to get at the back when the time came. The way to do it is to first clear out whatever hay is left over, move it out to the pasture, and then fill in from the back forward. Mama told me so that first night when she came out to inspect my work. You sure must love working out here, she said. If you do it that way, you'll be out here stacking for twice as long. Well, you have your fun, but I still expect you to be getting your homework and regular chores done. Come in and clean up for supper now. I jammed the pitchfork into a bale and washed for supper. The next afternoon, I resolved to do it right. I moved the bales I'd stacked up by the door to a corner and then started cleaning out the back. Before long, I'd uncovered the door into 1975. James! Mama called from the house. Dinner! I took a long look at the door. The wood on the edges had aged to the silvery brown of the rest of the barn boards, and it looked like it had been there forever. I could hardly remember a time when it wasn't there. I went in for supper. The next morning... I picked up my lunch and my school books, kissed Mama goodbye, and walked out. I stood on our porch for a long time, staring at the horse barn. I remembered the brave explorers in Vern's books. I looked over my shoulder at the closed door of our house, then walked slowly to the horse barn. I swung the door open and walked to the back. The triple bolts had rusted somewhat and took real shoving to slide back. One of them was stubborn. So I picked up the rake and pried it back with the handle, thinking how ingenious that was. I gave the door my shoulder and shoved, and it swung back, complaining on its hinges. On the other side was the still familiar dark of our 1975 apartment. I stepped into it and closed the door behind me. Lights, I said, and they came on. The old place was just like the day we left it. It wasn't even dusty. And as I heard the familiar trundle of the row butler, I knew why. My pa's easy chair sat in the parlor with a printout of the day's Salt Lake City bugler folded on the side table. I walked to one wall and laid my palm against it and the familiar cool glassy stuff it was made of. Window, I said, and wiped a line across the wall. Wherever my hand wiped went transparent. It was a sunny day in 1975, 1980 by then, but it would be 75 in my mind forever. Under the dome, Greater Salt Lake was warm and tranquil. I saw boys my age scooting around in jetpacks, dodging hover traffic. 
Pa liked to open a big square window when he came home and sit in his easy chair and smoke a stinky cigar and read the paper and cluck over it. Well, 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 he'd say, and how about that? Sometimes he'd have a tumbler of whiskey. He'd given me some once, and the stuff had burned like turpentine, and I swore I wouldn't try it again for a long, long time. I sat in Pa's easy chair and snapped up the newspaper, the way he used to. Panorama, I said, and Pa's square window opened before me. Whiskey, I said, and cigar, because I was never one for half measures. The row butler trundled over to me with a tumbler and a white owl in its hover field. I plucked them out. Cautiously, I put the cigar between my lips. The row butler extruded a long, snaky arm with a flame and lit it. I took a deep puff and coughed convulsively. Unthinking, I took a gulp of whiskey. I felt like my lungs had turned inside out. I finished both the whiskey and the cigar before I got up, taking cautious puffs and tiny sips, forcing myself. My head swam, and nausea nearly drowned me. I staggered into the W.C. and hung my head in the oubliette for an eternity, but nothing was coming up. I moved into my old bedroom and splayed out on my bed, watching the ceiling spin. Lights! I managed to croak, and the room went dark. When I woke in the morning, the walls were at half opacity, the normal 0700 schedule, and I dragged myself out of bed. The row butler had extruded the table and set out my breakfast, ham and eggs and a big bulb of milk. One look at it sent me over the edge, and I left a trail of sick all the way to the W.C. When I was done, I was as wrung out as a washcloth. My head pounded. The row butler was quietly cleaning up my mess. I started to order it to clear away breakfast, but discovered that I was miraculously hungry. I ate everything on the table, and seconds besides, and had the row butler juice my temples and clear away my headache. I dialed the walls to full transparency and watched the traffic go by. The row butler maneuvered itself into my field of vision and flashed a clock on its chest plate. Oh, 0800, oh, 0800, oh, 0800. It was my old school alarm. It snapped me back to reality. My mama was going to whip me raw. She must have been worried sick. I stood up and ran for the door. It was closed. I punched my coat into its panel and waited. Nothing happened. I calmed myself and punched it again. Still nothing. After trying it a hundred times, I convinced myself that it had been changed. I summoned the row butler and asked it for the code. Its chest panel lit up. Bad program. That's when I started to really worry. I was near to tears when I remembered the emergency override. I punched it in. Nothing happened. I think I started crying around then. I was stuck in 1975. Welcome back from part one of A Place So Foreign. Okay, why did we choose to stop right there? It seemed like the best spot to stop. It's a great kind of a cliffhanger spot. And the story was just too long for us to do in one single episode. Unless we just wanted to go without an episode for a whole month and a half or something while we put this together. Nigel would never forgive us. That's right. I basically make all the decisions that I make for the podcast with that one question in mind, is how would Nigel like this? So that's why I chose to do it this way. None of you would be alive if it weren't for my Nigel. <laughs> for a minute there, we considered splitting it into three parts, but we didn't. There just wasn't a good ending for a third part, if you know what I'm saying. The perfect spot to stop was that I was trapped in 1975. Wait, is that how I sound? I don't know how you oh, sounded. Oh, that reminds me. We tried doing it with just the normal <laughs> voice. And how far did we get? We recorded for like 15 minutes. I think we did. And then we said, you know, this sucks. And it sounds weird to say my pa with like, my pa said this. Yeah, it just didn't work with my regular voice, which, as you know, is still kind of countrified. And so we had to just start over and maintain the same 
accent, if you will, for the adult narrator and the kid. And if you recall, I initially wanted you to be the narrator and I to be the kid, <laughs> but you refused. Yes. It's all first person. You can't have that switch off. I didn't like that idea. Okay, well, we're going to keep this very, very short. Because the story so far has been very, very long, so we won't keep you much longer. We'll save any uh, discussion about the story for when the story is all complete, so we don't have to worry about, oh, have they heard this part yet? We'll try and get this down as short as possible. Uh, it gives you a heck of a lot more work to do, and me almost none. But that that's all right. I'll find a way to make up for it. But uh, as you know, submissions have reopened. If you have a story, please read the submission guidelines and then send us your story at submissions at doonsteef.com. If you would still like to send a question our way, the question line is still open for our all-reader question episode. You can send that to editor at doonsteef.com and uh, we'll take a look at it. And now it's time for What Is This? <laughs> I looked in the mirror and didn't like what I saw because the, the mirror whoa, was whoa, broken. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And I, what the hell is going on? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I was. This is a song for the Broken Mirror Story event. Do you remember that from last year? Uh huh. I always felt bad that we didn't have a theme song for that. So oh, I looked that, in wait, the wait, mirror. Wait, whoa. We had that super cool breaking glass sound. That's good enough, right? <laughs> Well, if you think so. I, I do. I mean, I've, I've worked long and hard on this. And, uh, Let's stick with, you know, we already branded. You don't want to rebrand. You know, you can't change horses midstream, as they say on Wag the Dog. Okay. I think we better stick with what we got. If you are new to the podcast, and I'm sure you are because you're here for Cory Doctorow, not us. The <laughs> Broken Mirror Story event is something we did last year as an experiment, and it worked out great. Yeah, it was really fun. We just came up with a premise something that Big and I used to do for fun, and assigned people to go ahead and write a story based on that premise. And we give them a month deadline. I guess it'd probably be the first week of June. Right. Since we're a little late on this one, uh, we'll say June 7th is the uh, deadline for getting the story done. That way it'll give you the weekend, and you can have it in on Monday. So I, I don't think we're going to bend on this one. It's June 7th. Anything that comes after June 7th, unless it's from a hot chick, it will be rejected. <laughs> so if you're going to turn it in late, be sure to include a picture of a hot chick, even if you're a dude, and Risha let it through. Uh, the idea is take this premise and run with it. You can write a short story. You can write a long story. You can write a mother-ass long story like chemo. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> and just get it to us, submissions at dunesteef.com. Just include broken mirror submission in your uh, slug line so that we'll know to funnel it to that folder. We'll elaborate in the future. We'll put up a post that gives the specific details of the rules. Last year, I think we chose five winners in the end that we did episodes of. I don't know that we can promise that this time. Yeah. I, I think the reason we did that last time was there were just so many good. Yeah, uh, we submission. wanted to give everybody a good taste of the different ways you could go with the same premise. So those that will wind up being made into episodes, we do have one story that usually winds up being the winner. And then the others are kind of finalists that also get put on the air. But we also put all the stories on our website so that everyone can read them and see uh, what everybody did with the idea so that we can, they can all have the fun that we have when we're judging. It's not just Big and me that make the decision. We have our slush readers that read the submissions. Right. And uh, they have to read all of the stories and vote on them. And then we just tally all the numbers together and proclaim a winner. If you'd like to be one of those readers, just let us know at editor at doonsteef.com. And what is our premise for this year, Rich Outfield? The Broken Mirror story event premise for 2010 is A child is proclaimed king Or queen But it turns out to be more than just a game You can do this story any way you want You can take it in some sort of a science fiction direction A horror direction, a fantasy direction Funny Humorous direction, a regular Heartbreaking yeah, so palette is wide open for you to choose whatever you, you like. We'll remind you uh, every episode until June. So get to work. Start thinking, imagining, making that story, and start writing. Thanks for participating to everybody who does. Okay, you've been listening long enough. We will let you go your way.
We'd like to thank Corey for letting us share his story with you or for sharing his story with us so that we could in turn share it with you. And you could in turn share... All right, I'm stopping. (laughs) Okay. And one other thing, if you would like to uh, take a look at our site, we do have our donation button up. So if you want to swing over there and press the button, you can donate five bucks a month, five bucks a quarter, or a one-time donation of whatever you choose. You know, it would be very much appreciated. And if you donate... There are some special gifts that you can receive from Rish Outfield himself. Otto, you're playing the wrong message. (laughs) All right, so I guess that's it for us today. Uh, Thanks for listening, and be sure to be watching back again next week when we finish this story off. Do you think you can get it in a week? Or close to it. (laughs) I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. I just It'll be a week-ish. So I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. Last night, Darth Vader came down from the planet Vulcan and told me that if I didn't take Lorraine out, that he'd melt my brain. Let's let's just keep all this brain-melting stuff to ourselves, okay? See you later, folks. That brings us to the end of the show. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. See you guys later. I'm going for a smoke break. Take two. And tinker and swear and hit his thumbnail and tear his pants on a straight dingus and smoke his cheroots and have a heck of a time. See, I thought dingus was something else. <laughs> I friggin' suck at fake laughs. <laughs> and I'd promise my best pal Ollie Schweinstick. Swain's daughter. You're kidding me. Swain's daughter? Swain's daughter. And I'd promise my best pal Ollie. Ollie. And I'd promise my best pal Ollie. Ollie. All my chums were waiting there to see us off. And I'd promised my best pal, Oli. <laughs> ah, open o Oli. All my chums were waiting there to see us off. And I'd prom- Damn it. And I'd promised my best pal, Oli Swainstetter, that... Damn it. I'd even tussled with one girl, Katibi Mbuto. Katibi Mbuto. Good job. I'd even tussled with one girl... Katibi Mamputo. God damn it. <laughs> Punched me so hard in the guts I saw stars. I fell to the ground, gasping. I looked up at a forest of strong bare legs and really, really, really small penises and knew they'd surrounded me. I walked through the cool dark, the only light coming from the grimy attic window, and fondled each piece. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, he's fondling the air. And fo- oh, it's not all he's doing who had worked as a roustabout, a telegraph operator, and a merchant seaman taught them it. Yes, I said seaman, ladies. My mother says I have to go to the academy. She does, hey. How do you feel about that? It don't mean dick how I feel, sir. I'm just a kid in the past. How dare you speak like that? I said, sir. Let me see your knuckles. I'm going to beat them. The report cards came out in the middle of December. Mr. Adelson sealed them with thick brown wax in his pants. Mr. Adelson sealed them with wax and thick brown envelopes. I went to my room and stripped down. You want me to strip down? No! (laughs) Adults? Canadians say adults? This is my Canadian accent, can't you tell? Yeah, it sounds just like one. Sounds just like my wife. That's right. I'll save the dirty remark for later. All right, Ollie Svenstatter. He must have an enormous Svenstatter. Ollie and I had been chums since we could walk, and we'd had a few fights in our days. Uh. And we liked to burp at each other sometimes. It was a gay thing we used to do. Then unwrapped the parcel in the parlor. The lesson plans were there, laid out day by day, and in the center of them was a smaller parcel. Wrapped in colored paper. Oh, my gosh, we got three in the same pair. <laughs> Did you notice that? 
I didn't see the. Th what is the third one? Oh, parlor. Okay. I saw centre and colored paper. Okay. I went home and did my chores, then unwrapped the parcel in the parlour. The lesson plans were there, laid out day by day, and in the centre of them was a smaller parcel wrapped in colored paper. Merry Canadia Day was written across it. Okay, well, I'm feeling like this is the end of our first day. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, um, too. At the end of this thing, he stuck in 1975, and that's a good... Stopping place, yeah. Good place, a good cliffhanger to leave him wanting more. I think so, too. I mean, it's just, it feels like it. It's, it's like it's coming on. I don't know, the same way that you can feel the end of a TV show or yeah. the moment leading up to a commercial. Or that time when, like, if you wait any further, you're going to poop in your pants instead of getting it into the toilet. I usually wait a little bit after that. <laughs> Darn it. This is going to have to be more... Jimendo.com! It has to be more countrified What's the name of the guy that I like to touch, Jimendo? Oh, well, we'll end there. Roger Subirana! Warning! Today's episode contains singing. Subirana! looking to see if he had any songs that I could use on that last episode when I wanted to put in that weird, creepy... <laughs> They call that Australian <laughs> didgeridoo. Foggy sight. For a moment there, we considered splitting it into. Stop it! I remember when all of this was farmland, as far as the eye could see. Old man Peabody owned all of this. He had this crazy idea about breeding pine trees. Don't feel like you have to write a Dune Steve style story even as you write. Just write what you think is great because that's the best part of this whole event is the rainbow of colors of different stories that we get. It's just really interesting. There's lots of colors in the homo rainbow. Whoa. <laughs>